Hello, good evening, everybody. Myself, Dr. Gopal Bora. I am associate professor in Department of Medicine in Jodhpur, and also looking after infectious disease division in this center with Dr. Deepak Sharma. Uh, today, we have gathered here uh, for a thematic infectious disease CME uh, with HIV and opportunistic infection. I think this is one of the topics which is of very much relevance in this time. And we are regularly seeing patients in which we are confused whether these are opportunistic infections, whether these are iris, and many times we delay the diagnosis in these cases. This uh, CME is being organized in collaboration with uh, CIDS, Clinical Infectious Disease Society. Uh, we are fortunate that under guidance of uh, Professor Arvind Mathur, sir, we have initiated the Jodhpur chapter of uh, this uh, society. And we have more than 35 members in the Jodhpur chapter. Uh, students are also participating in this. The MD students are also participating in this, as well as the DMID students are also participating. We are fortunate to be among one of the first institutions which has started a DMID program, and uh, we have already uh, have six students with us. So, with this introduction, uh, I would like to invite Professor Alvin Mathur sir. Professor Alvin Mathur sir needs no introduction. He's a doctor of medicine, and I think each one of us in this region and over all over India has been blessed with his guidance. Uh, he has been uh, retired principal of Essen Medical College and director at Mary, and perhaps involved in most of the infectious disease programs or activities that are going on in this region. So I will request Professor Arvind Mathur sir to initiate the program and uh, bless us with his uh, talk. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gopal, uh, for giving me this opportunity. And I'm really fortunate that uh, under your uh, team's uh, active participation, we have been able to start the CIDS Jodhpur chapter and has taken the taken lead in uh, infectious disease education itself. So today we are here for one important uh, session, and that is uh, regarding HIV and opportunistic infections, and we want to make uh, things easy for clinicians. And that has been our theme today of our talk, where we want to uh, work 
to have the uh, the the uh, the presentation for the clinicians who are working in the field and would like to have um, give them an overview of the opportunistic infections which occur with hiv so uh, my task is to give you an overview so i'll just briefly introduce the issues related to opportunistic infections so we all uh, know that human Im immunodeficiency virus is a retrovirus and when i look at look back uh, to the past we had the opportunity of seeing the uh, start of this pandemic and thereafter we have seen the the human endeavor and the effort which has been there they they have been able to control this pandemic so it was long back in uh, 1981 when in Los Angeles in June month only itself, so almost we are um, 41 years from that time, that the initial cases which were supposed to be cases of acquired immunodeficiency were reported. And then it was detected that this virus affects the immune system leading to AIDS. Now the AIDS, which has been, uh, 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 which is uh, uh, is the uh, is the uh, acquired immunodeficiency that is means that there is an a, a, a reduction in the cd4 count and which makes individuals more vulnerable for infections malignancies and neurological diseases and that that has been the uh, the the, um, the those things have be, been uh, included in the definition of AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Okay, now when we started with the this particular disease entity, the opportunistic infections were the first clinical manifestations like PC pneumonia, which the uh, pneumonia which occurred and that showed that there is something wrong over there. So opportunistic infections were the first clinical manifestations and that alerted to the, this particular pandemic. When we talk of opportunistic infection, these are the diseases of microbial agents in a person who is with a compromised host immune system. So the host is, uh, is, com is immunocompromised that's why the infections, which would not have had caused any disease in an immunocompetent person, they would cause the infection or the disease in them. So, so now when we look at this, uh, the, uh, the HIV related uh, opportunistic infections, because the HIV has caused immunosuppression, we found, we find that there are certain opportunistic infections which have been hallmark of AIDS. For the diagnosis of AIDS, their presence was considered as a criteria for diagnosis of AIDS, like pneumocystis uh, pneumonia, toxoplasma and, and syphilitis, CME retina, retinitis, cryptococcal meningitis, tuberculosis, uh, and MAC disease. Or, so even certain cancers like Kaposi sarcoma or central nervous system lymphoma, they were the conditions which uh, would uh, help us in diagnosing AIDS. And in, even in whenever we had a case definition, occurrence of these diseases would be considered as a, a diagnostic point. The, when we saw these patients in earlier days, I'll just narrate about situations of late 80s or early 90s or so. Uh, and probably in India, we started having major problem in the late 90s. That's what that was the time when we were getting lot many patients. So they would come with unexplained problems or un, and these OIs would occur seven to 10 years after the infection, when the CD4 count had gone down. And it has been now shown that and it was realized at that time also that CD4 count decided about the type of opportunistic infection uh, the person would have. And in the earlier days, occurrence of OI meant almost a death warrant because with no management, uh, 
within one or two years, these patients used to succumb to the disease. Now, in these two, three slides, we'll see that CD4 count or the immune status of the individual decides about the type of infection which would be there. So in a person with a almost a normal, uh, above 500 counts, they would have a normal community acquired infections. But when it goes down between 200 to 500, then tuberculosis, oral candidiasis, herpes zoster, these things would occur. When it goes down, then PCP, superficial candidiasis, or mucoctinous herpes. And when it is less than 50, we would have toxoplasma, cryptococcus, MAC, or CMB, or so, PML, or so. So the, the CD4 count or the immune status would decide about the type of opportunistic infection which an individual will have. These are the slides which have, uh, we have uh, taken from the the national um, uh, report uh, uh, where it also depicts the way the disease progresses from the onset to the uh, late stage when with the immunosuppression, the patient gets the various types of ma ma manifestations. And again, this slide also shows the, the type of infections which would occur and the clinical clues which would be there or so. I think we will be discussing these in, during the, our subsequent presentations by our distinguished speakers. So once the opportunistic infections were identified in 80s, then we started working on how to manage them. Initially, issues came up with the, with the chemotherapeutic agents were used to treat those diseases. And then it was realized that some chemoprophylaxis could be done. And those chemoprophylaxis issues would be again discussed with the coming uh, presentations when we started using uh, trimethoprim sulfa for PCP or so. Then the better management of OIs was done. Immunization was considered to be one uh, thing which could prevent or delay the OI. So the, these things helped in improving the quality of life. Then the antiretroviral drugs came when we started using NRTIs. Even we have uh, opportunity of using single NRTI or a dual uh, regime or so. With them also, the incidence of OI started coming down. And now with the availability of heart, where we have got a very effective ART regimes and durable viral suppression is there, the OIs have come down considerably, but still in the uh, still in the presence of the ART, OIs are still occurring. Why? Because not all HIV infections are diagnosed. And once diagnosed, many persons have already experienced substantial immunosuppression and that causes OI. Not all persons with diagnosed HIV receive timely continuous HIV care or are prescribed ART. And even not all persons treated for HIV achieve durable viral suppression. So all these things, they limit the, uh, the viral suppression and that's why OIs continue to occur now also. And there are certain infections which are not eliminated by only even by uh, viral suppression. One more thing that certain OIs, particularly tuberculosis and syphilis, they increase the viral load, HIV viral load. They cause acceleration of HIV and increase the risk of HIV transmission. So OIs still continue to be the sentinel events leading to a diagnosis of HIV infection, or they present as a complication of unsuccessful viral suppression. So now what we have to do to address the menace of opportunistic infections. And as a clinician, when you are treating somebody, that is the one important task which we have, that we should recognize the characteristic symptom patterns of these serious and frequent OIs. So we have to learn about what are the frequent OIs occurring in uh, these patients in our area. And then after see that we follow and we analyze their symptom patterns properly. 
And once the, we identify them, we have to institute prompt and effective treatment and also preventive advice has to be given. We need to diagnose HIV status quite early in the course so that we do not let them per, uh, deteriorate into a serious immunosuppression. And whenever we are going to start ART, we have to do screening for OI because that is the uh, one effort to prevent or reduce the chances of IRS or immune uh, reconstitution syndrome. Now, again, the chemo prophylaxis and immune prophylaxis or immuno immunization, etc., have to be used for to prevent OIs. And we have to know the geographical uh, uh, prevalence of the causative agents. Like I tell you, in our place, leishmaniasis is common. In certain other places, penicillosis is common. When we saw it in Southeast Asia or so, the penicillosis is quite common over there. In our area, leishmaniasis is common. So we have to know which, uh, which are the or agents which are common in our area. Then, of course, pregnancy-related uh, evaluations and during the use of drugs during pregnancy have to be learned. And one more thing, with the occurrence of OI, they need to be re receive, uh, receiving so many drugs. So drug interactions, they would also have to be tackled. So these are the tasks which a clinician would have to undertake to manage, address the OIs. Because in spite of ART, ART has reduced the hospitalization, has reduced the mortality of HIV infected patients. Still, the opportunistic infections, they remain the major cause of HIV associated morbidity and mortality, and but more so in uh, low uh, middle income countries like ours, basically. One simple thing which has to be followed and which has to be advised, these are the simple preventive measures which have to be advised to the patient or all um, people living with HIV, that they have to eat properly cooked food because we have seen so many OIs, they occur because of consumption of uncooked food or uncooked meat or so. Drinking boiled water is important. Hand washing is equally important. And one has to avoid high risk situations where there is a risk of infection is high by overcrowding, etc. And of course, in COVID time, we have all been taught about face masks and keeping physical distancing. Appropriate and timely immunization is another important thing which has to be uh, done. We'll see that also. Now, when it comes to immunization, uh, we'll have to just, uh, by itself, it is in a big uh, subject which one will have to deal in details. But I'll just like to tell that many live virus vaccines are contraindicated in these subjects. And like live attenuated influenza vaccine need not, cannot be given to them. Then we have a situation where the CD4 count is less. There are certain vaccines which we cannot use. And, but in certain cases, we have to have some recommendations for certain vaccines like hepatitis A, B, or meningococcal, depending upon the specific situation of that individual. For COVID-19 also, we already had recommendations that they should receive it. For other infections like Joster or varicella, there are recommendations and specific recommendations for immunization in these subjects. So immunization has to be looked into and it is, uh, um, we have to be watchful about certain immune vaccines which are contraindicated, but remaining have to be administered to them, okay? Now, once we have talked about the how to approach these patients and how to try and prevent these situations, we meet with challenges of managing OIs in our clinical setting. When we, when we are in our practice, when we are in field, then there are issues of a uh, lack of clinical expertise because many times the the clinician who has not been exposed to the uh, the subject 
may miss the OIs when we, they encounter those patients. That is one thing. Then certain diagnostic tests which are needed, like even in certain situations, we need to go for radiological tests like MRI, CT, or certain um, some microbiological tests, etc., which may not be available in, in all the places. And certain specialist services, like we may need ophthalmologist for management of CMV retinitis or certain pulmonologists, which may not be available in the, the peripheral centers or so. And then there are treatment related challenges. Like the most of the diseases, they need very long duration of treatment because in certain situations in earlier days when the ART was not that effective, it meant a lifetime administration of chemo post secondary prophylaxis or so. Availability of certain drugs is also an issue because uh, I remember we had patients of CMV retinitis and we were not able to get gencyclovir long back. I'm talking of 2005, 2006, etc. So availability of drugs is a, an, an issue. And then one more thing, all these OIs, they have a very limited options for treatment. You'll see that there are only few drugs which are effective for them. So all these challenges, they make our clinical practice more difficult. I'll just dwell upon for a couple of minutes on uh, current situation in India that um, luckily you will see that the incidence and prevalence in India has started declining. And when you see figures from 2000 to 2020, there is a significant decline in the number of cases. Still, we have got more than 23 lakh uh, patients, persons living with HIV and AIDS, out of which luckily with a very strong uh, national uh, AIDS control organization program, we have got more than 13 lakh persons on ART, probably so one of the, uh, the great achievement of India because we, nowhere else such a strong program for HIV is going on. So we have got more than 13 lakh persons right now on ART. We do not have much uh, information about the prevalence of OIs, but we have uh, information that the commonest OI in our region is tuberculosis, oral candidiasis, followed by diarrhea, herpes joster, herpes simplex, then cryptococcal meningitis, PCP, CMV, retinitis, toxoplasma, and bacterial pneumonia or so. So these are the, uh, the estimates proportion of the uh, OIs which are seen in India. And when you look at the symptoms, the common symptoms with the, which these persons with OI would come are fever, weight loss, cough, dyspnea, lymphadenopathy, diarrhea, certain other symptoms like abdominal pain, skin lesions, night sweats, etc. could occur. So we have to be vigilant whenever we encounter these common symptoms in patients with, uh, with, who is positive for HIV, that we try and look for OIs in those particular patients. OIs have been classified based on the type of pathogen, they are bacterial, viral, fungal, and parasitic, because all pathogens, all pathogens are capable of causing opportunistic infection. And in uh, we'll be discussing few of them in coming sessions. And what we find in, in uh, salmonellosis is another important thing, which is there with uh, then various viruses, which are even viruses which are responsible for lymphoma or PML or uh, so all these viruses are there. So this list, uh, this gives an, a big list of the organisms which are responsible for OIs in these persons. And the OIs have been also been classified depending upon the system with which they affect. And commonly you will find that the OIs are related to either respiratory system, GI system, CNS, and skin and mucous membrane. So these are the common sites where the, these infections are seen. And we'll see that when, uh, when we have the discussions about these cases, that we'll see different, uh, different common problems over there or so. I'll just dwell upon two, uh, two three uh, problems. Toxoplasma is one issue 
which may be a reactivation of the previous infection or a new infection. And it is one disease which uh, toxoplasma encephalitis, which causes a focal deficit in the uh, pa patient. So if you have an uh, HIV patient who has got a headache uh, and uh, along with this, if he shows focal deficit, first think of cerebral toxoplasmosis. And it is very well seen in the CT scan with the multiple ring enhancing lesions. And uh, of course, uh, you, you, the diagnosis would be clinched by presence of focal deficit and the CT scan changes, which would show up as in a multiple uh, ring enhancing lesions commonly seen in the basal ganglia. Okay. And management here would lie on pyrimethamine. And if pyrimethamine is not there, then we may have to depend upon trimethamine sulfa also. At times, with uh, uh, we have to uh, give combination of them and with folinic acid or so. So this is one uh, condition. The other, quickly, I'll just talk about CMV because CMV retinitis is one important cause of loss of vision in these particular patients where ophthalmologists will be, have, will be able to tell us about the retinal lesions, which are typical retinal lesions which are seen in them. And it has to be treated with antiviral drug, which has to be given for uh, almost 21 days. And after that also, the, the, the chronic maintenance therapy has to go on for a pretty long time. Then one important problem which occurs in uh, persons with severe immunodeficiency is MAC or mycobacterium avium complex disease. These patients would come with wasting, they are emaciated, they would have diarrhea, persistent fever, and hepatosplenomegaly and anemia is also seen. One important thing which we have noticed is that whenever in your test, if with this immunosuppression, if you find alkaline phosphatase in, in way high, definitely think of MAC because that is one condition which would present like this. Because remaining diagnostic tests are a bit cumbersome. They, you, you cannot, uh, uh, isolation by culture, etc. is not possible everywhere. So, and of course, the, in this management, we have to think of clarithromycin, ethambutol, or, or uh, azithromycin or so. So, so uh, other uncommon OIs which uh, we had a chance of encountering was bartonellosis is one which basically angiometrosis, which gives us to a typical uh, skin lesions. The penicillosis or telluromycosis that also leads to skin lesions or so and other uh, and fungal disorders. And of course, one has to look for neurological problems like uh, when we have CNS lymphomas or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy or neurosyphilis or so. So these are the other uncommon OIs. And uh, with this, the NACO has given some preventive advices which will be discussed during the coming sessions. And also the, uh, the, the uh, various uh, uh, precautions one has to uh, take while starting ART in these cases have also been defined by NACO, which would be discussed in coming sessions because the, those are the common OIs where we have to think of these precautions because IRS is a major issue and which will be one of the sessions we will be having over there. So, dear colleagues, I just want to conclude by telling that OIs remain the major driver of HIV-associated morbidity and mortality, still in spite of ART. And we have to be on lookout for OIs in all uh, PLHIVs or with timely diagnosis, exact treatment, and providing prophylactic management. TB remains the most common OI present in India, followed by candidiasis and diarrhea and the other, as we have mentioned. So we have to be watchful for looking for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll be available for any questions or queries. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your talk and guiding us about the common opportunity infections that we see in HIV and the care that we should be taking in managing these patients.
Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Rajiv Karthik, sir. Dr. Rajiv Karthik, sir, is currently working in Department of Infectious Disease, and he has a special interest in HIV AIDS, Department of Infectious Disease, CMC Vellore. Uh, we are very thankful to him for uh, giving this talk, guiding us in this. We are a new uh, addition to the SIDS uh, India. So we are very thankful that he has guided us in this endeavor. So Dr. Rajiv Karthik sir will be giving a talk on double trouble HIV and AIDS. Sir. Good evening. Am I am I heard? Yes, sir. Clearly okay. audible. First of all, um, I would like to congratulate the SIDS Jodhpur chapter on organizing this CME and uh, Professor Harvin Mato, Dr. Gopal, Dr. Deepak. Um, really well done in conducting this CME and you know uh, taking the time and effort to uh, put in this academic session. Uh, so that you know it is available for everybody to um, uh, to hear. So I'm just going to um, share my screen. Just give me a second. Sir, I think you can able to share the screen. Yeah, well, this is one second and just, yeah, uh, yeah. just get there. I think it'll be visible now. Yeah, yes, sir. Okay. So um, uh, again, thank you everyone for um, inviting me for this talk. And um, uh, what I'm going to be talking about in the next uh, about uh, 20, 25 minutes is uh, the, the double pandemic that we are witnessing of TB and HIV. And uh, I've, uh, you know, the talk has been labeled double trouble. And definitely it is something that uh, we all commonly encounter. I think um, as infectious disease physicians and, uh, you know, uh, general medicine physicians as well, uh, a large proportion of what we see and do is related to HIV and TB. And a significant proportion of our time is sort of um, spent in uh, dealing with these two problems. Um, so going ahead, um, this is going to be the outline of my presentation. A little bit on the introduction, um, how we screen for TB in HIV positive patients, how we diagnose TB, and how we treat HIV TB co-infection. So I think with that, that will sort of cover uh, essentially uh, what I want to talk about uh, in HIV TB co-infection. As uh, Professor Mathur had told us, uh, for us in India, TB is by far the most common opportunistic infection that we see. And it accounts for almost 60% of all sort of opportunistic infections um, in the setting of HIV. So <clears throat> all the other uh, opportunistic infections put together uh, will not uh, you know, make up the percentage that uh, uh, TB alone um, uh, sort of makes up. So uh, just a little bit about the epidemiology. Um, of all the HIV infected patients worldwide, about 30% 30, 30 of them um, actually have um, uh, evidence of TB infection. And this probably could be either latent or active infection. Um, conversely, in 2017, of 10 million new cases of TB, about 1.2 million were among people with HIV AIDS. And tuberculosis accounts for about 25% of all um, AIDS-related deaths worldwide. And that is if you take all the countries put together. If you take um, countries such as Sub-Saharan Africa and the low middle-income countries where tuberculosis is rampant, this number even goes up to almost 75 to 80% of all AIDS-related deaths is because of tuberculosis. So this is just, I've just put it up to show you, um, you know, MDR, TB, TB, HIV, and TB are like uh, three circles in a Venn diagram. And um, if you look at the countries that are, you know, largely affected, it is, um, you know, predominantly Sub-Saharan Africa, 
Southeast Asia, and of course, um, India is a big player um, in that as well. So what makes this HIV and TB so bad? It has been actually labeled by some as the perfect storm. And um, why is this, why are these two diseases, you know, so bad for each other? So it has been described as an intersection of these two diseases is a synergy from hell. Okay, so of course we know that both these diseases are concentrated in areas of poverty, where there are minimal resources for diagnosis, treatment and infectious uh, and infection control. And despite all the advances that we have in the field of HIV with ART, early initiation of ART, unfortunately, both these diseases when present together, they really um, drive the other, the, the other disease as well. And each epidemic seems to accelerate the other and cause a worse prognosis. So what does TB do to the HIV infection? Um, so uh, TB induced cytokines actually uh, enhance the viral replication. So there is a faster progression to clinical AIDS. So this means there's a rise in viral load and a decline in the CD4 count. Um, TB and HIV death rate is twice that of HIV positive um, matched controls who have a similar CD4 count. So with, H with, with TB and HIV, the death rate is almost twice as that with that of just HIV alone. Um, what does HIV do to um, tuberculosis? Uh, HIV is by far the most significant risk factor uh, for developing active TB, and this is about 10% per year uh, among uh, co-infected patients. And over the last 20, 30 years, the rapid global uh, rise in the burden of TB is directly related to the uh, increase in the um, HIV cases. Um, so just a brief word about India. We have about 300 million patients who are TB infected. Um, this means it could uh, it is both latent and uh, TB uh, disease. Out of which sputum positive is about 3.6 million. It constitutes about a very small percentage. And about 17 million actually have the um, TB disease. So um, as we saw in the previous presentation, um, the, 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 the stage of HIV or the stage of the immune system or the CD4 count um, sort of predicts what sort of tuberculosis um, you are likely to develop. And unlike some of the other opportunistic infections um, like cryptococcus, CMV, PCP, which occur with very low CD4 counts, it is important to note that tuberculosis can actually occur with any uh, CD4 count. But the type of tuberculosis that one may develop is uh, dependent on the CD4 count. So CD4 is a 500 and above, you're most likely to just have pulmonary disease. Um, as you come down, you, you're likely to develop TB lymphadenitis. TB meningitis is usually seen in advanced disease. And by the time the CD4 drops to less than 100, you have very, very extensive and disseminated disease, though it might be more evident or obvious in only one location. So this is the risk of development of TB. And if you look at um, on the left, if you look at somebody who is TB infected, that means PPD positive, but HIV negative, the life, lifetime risk of developing TB is about 10%. Whereas somebody who is infected, that is PPD positive, but HIV positive, the lifetime risk is about 60%. So TB is, uh, TB is much more common in somebody with HIV. And one of, it is one of the major risk factors for the development of uh, HIV is one of the major risk factors for the development of TB. So how does TB sort of differ in HIV and in a normal individual? And does it differ between early and late HIV? So we are taught very early in our medical school that um, you know, tuberculosis in the immunocompetent individual predominantly causes uh, cavitary disease and upper lobe disease. So that is uh, traditionally what we, we learn. And that is also true when uh, we encounter TB in the early stages of HIV. But however, later on, when um, the immunity is very compromised, uh, there are a lot of atypical presentations in the severely immunocompromised. You have significant uh, bilateral disease, you have significant lower lobe involvement, and you have significant nodal disease. So there is a difference between uh, the presentation of tuberculosis in the early stages of HIV or an HIV negative individual from the late stage. Again, uh, the type of TB presentation 
in an HIV negative individual, it's more likely to have upper lobe involvement and the presence of cavities. Um, and it's more likely to have predominantly pulmonary disease with extra pulmonary being only about 15 to 20%. However, in advanced HIV, as I mentioned, lower lobe involvement, lymphadenopathy, miliary TB, effusions, these are all um, sort of atypical presentations of, of TB that is commonly seen in advanced disease. And the percentage of extra pulmonary and pulmonary disease and most, more often disseminated disease is almost the same. Uh, compare this with uh, somebody who is uh, immunocompetent where they predominantly have pulmonary disease. Another important thing for us to remember is that this putum positivity rate drops to as low as 30% in um, advanced HIV. So relying on sputum positive, uh, sputum positivity for smears is not going to get you the, 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 the diagnosis. So that sort of leads us nicely into the, into the next small segment is how do we screen for TB in HIV patients? And here by screening, I mean uh, patients who are asymptomatic, who have been diagnosed to have HIV. Um, how do we screen for patients? Because, uh, you know, TB, HIV is so common. How do we screen patients? And um, this is a, a large cohort that looks at, um, uh, you know, four cardinal symptoms. Uh, current cough, fevers, night sweats, and weight loss. And as in the previous presentation, we heard um, this is the usual presentation of for anybody with an opportunistic infection. Uh, but um, this large cohort showed us that if, if uh, somebody had any one of these symptoms, uh, the sensitivity um, is about 80% and the specificity is about 50%. What is important to note is look at the negative predictive value. If in the absence of these symptoms, uh, it is very likely that this person does not have TB. So more than the sensitivity and specificity here, it is a negative predictive value that is important. If you add in an X-ray and you look at only people with an abnormal chest X-ray, and if you look at these four symptoms, current cough, fever, night sweats, and weight loss, the sensitivity actually increases to 91%. So fairly sensitive test, specificity is very poor at only 39%, but again, the negative predictive value is, is very high. So if um, somebody does not have these symptoms and has a normal chest X-ray, you can fairly certainly say that they don't have tuberculosis. So looking at different settings, in the community, this, uh, this symptom screen doesn't do very well with the low sensitivity and specificity, but in a clinic or in somebody whose CD4 count is 95, uh, is, is less than 200, sorry, and somebody who is um, not screened for TB, the sensitivity does fairly well, again, with a good negative predictive value. For, so what does this all mean? It means that for asymptomatic individuals or people who are living with PLHIV who need to be screened for TB, and a screening algorithm looking at four symptoms um, current cough, fever, weight loss, and night sweats um, is a good screening tool. And in the absence of these symptoms and a negative chest X-ray, they're extremely unlikely to have active tuberculosis. So that is a, this is a good way to, when, when, when we are seeing patients in the OPD, patients with absence of symptoms and a normal chest X-ray, it's very unlikely that they actually have tuberculosis. So now moving on, coming to uh, sort of patients who are symptomatic and we need to make a diagnosis of tuberculosis, how are we going to make a, make a diagnosis? And there are several mod modalities to make a diagnosis. There is a clinical diagnosis, there's radiology, there's histopathology, and there is microbiology. And I really don't you know, um, um, have the sort of time to go into all of these things. So I'm only going to talk about uh, sort of uh, one diagnostic modality that has recently become available. In the, and those are the newer molecular diagnostics that we have. And I'm talking about, you know, we all know about this. We, we're talking about the gene expert, uh, which is a nucleic acid amplification test. It's a rapid test with a turnaround time of less than two hours. It tells us two things, the presence of MTB, as well as the presence of a Fampersin resistance. And, and we know that it's far better than the conventional diagnostic TB tools. So basically this is a molecular beacon assay and it diagnoses both the presence of MTB and rifampicin resistance mutations, looking at an 81 base, base pair regions between codons 426 and 452 of the RPOB gene, which is known as the rifampicin resistance determining region. 
So this is how your report will, will show. Um, there is amplification of all five probes in this, in this report, which means that this is rifampicin sensitive. Here you can see the green line is flat. So there's a failure of amplification of probe B, which means rifampicin resistance. So that's how we read this, um, this test. So sensitivity and specificity of uh, um, pool samples. Um, overall, the sensitivity seems to be over 85% with a specificity of 98%. For pulmonary disease, it's a little better with the 87 uh, sensitivity and 97 specificity. But if you look at the last three rows, uh, you, you could see that extra pulmonary disease, children, uh, HIV positive individuals, and the smear negative individuals, the sensitivity sort of drops off. And this is where uh, over the last couple of years, we have all transitioned to an expert ultra. What is the advantage? Is that the sensitivity of the ultra is about 5% higher than the, than the conventional expert. Um, this is markedly higher in patients who are smear negative, HIV infected patients, and also children. So there's a significant rise in sensitivity of the ultra compared to the uh, routine expert. However, this is associated with a 3.2 lower percent of uh, a drop in the specificity. And this seems to be more in patients who have had a history of TB and than in somebody who doesn't have TB. And then we all know the problem with trace calls. Uh, we see a lot of uh, ultra trace positives um, and many of them turn out to be false positives. So uh, it's a very sensitive test because it looks at two additional insertion sequences, but we do face a problem with trace calls. However, the rifampicin resistance detection sort of remains the same. So currently WHO has placed ultra to replace wherever the expert was used. And it is probably more sensitive in smear negative culture positive specimens, pediatric specimens, extra pulmonary disease, and in those with HIV infection. So in conclusion, when trying to diagnose somebody with uh, TB in the setting of HIV, uh, using a gene expert or a gene, ex gene, gene expert ultra should be your test of choice. Yes, expert ultra has now come in and we have data that it may be better than the conventional gene expert. Um, always TB diagnosis is, is a composite diagnosis. Um, just because I've not put the other diagnostic modalities like line probe, you know, radiology, histopath, and just a clinical diagnosis doesn't mean that it's not important. But I just wanted to make this point that in the setting of PLHIV, we must use the newer uh, molecular diagnostics to make a diagnosis. The next part of uh, HIV TB co infection is how are we going to treat our patients with HIV TB co infection? And um, we look at TB pharmacotherapy in the HIV setting. When to place ART with TB? I think this is a question um, that is becoming more and more clear that uh, there were a lot of doubts about this several years ago, but now it's becoming more and more clear. In somebody with co-infection, how do we start uh, ART with, uh, along with ATT? And the third is how to control inflammation in patients with HIV who have TB. Okay, so I'm just wanting to illustrate a certain syndrome with this case. The 35-year-old male who presented with a history of some weight loss and some low-grade fevers on and off. He was found to be HIV positive and then was referred for further management. The CD4 was about 130 and all his fever workup that was done um, was negative. And uh, this was several years ago when he was started on a, a regimen of uh, tenofovir uh, emtricitabine, if aberrance, as was the standard of care at that point in time. Three weeks later, he landed up with uh, persisting fevers, feeling unwell, uh, very large uh, lymph nodes that were not previously there that were discharging pus. Um, so we had admitted him and he had some routine tests along with the repeated x-ray. So this, you can see these large and large nodes uh, in his neck that were not previously there. Um, on my left is the initial chest x-ray and on the right is the current chest x-ray, which actually sh almost shows a miliary pattern and this sputum AFB expert and smear also come back as positive. So this is a syndrome of the uh, immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome or IRIS. And what this means is, is, is that there is a paradoxical deterioration in the clinical status of the patient, despite satisfactory control of viral replication and improvement in CD4 counts. So this is an exuberant, exuberant inflammatory response. And the previously, uh, it could be a diagnosed opportunistic infection, 
or it could be an unmasking virus where there's an incubating opportunistic pathogen or infection that was not found before the ART was started. So this is a syndrome that we come across um, associated with several opportunistic infections. And this definitely is a worry when we start antiretroviral therapy in our TB patients. So treating HIV TB is challenging. Uh, there are a lot of issues, including pill burden, uh, drug toxicity, the most notorious of them is hepatotoxicity, um, other drug toxicities, looking for drug interactions, um, and immune reconstitution syndrome. So these are some of the challenges that we sort of face. So what we want when we treat patients with TB is one, we need a good regimen of the TB drugs. So to kill the TB bacilli more effectively. And we also need to control the host immune response. For this, we can think of adjunctive steroids or host directed therapy that is becoming more and more important these days. So is TB therapy different in patients with HIV compared to the normal therapy? Uh, several things that we must uh, understand. One is there is no role for alternate day regimen or thrice weekly regimen that was previously practiced. And this was significantly associated with a higher risk of relapse, which is 2.8 time, uh, the odds was 2.8 compared to a daily regimen. So it's absolutely essential for daily therapy to be given in patients with PLHIV. Duration of treatment remains the same as in HIV negative individuals. There is no change. There is no role for a short course therapy in patients with HIV. Uh, there's a lot of uh, debate that goes on between uh, fixed dose combinations and weights based individual, individual drugs. Um, I'm not sure that there is convincing evidence one behind the other. They both have their pros and cons. And um, I think um, everybody would be comfortable uh, in their practice in, in, in doing what they feel um, is, is best. So another question that is asked is, what should we give first? So it is imperative that when there is TB and HIV, we always treat the TB first. And this is true for any opportunistic infection that we come across. Any opportunistic infection, including TB, needs to be treated before the HIV infection is treated. And there have been several studies over the years, the STRIDE study, uh, the Camellia trial, the SAPIT study, the Temperano study. All these studies have looked at early versus late uh, introduction of ART after ATT has been given. So early means two weeks and late is you know anything beyond two weeks. And um, in my next slide, I will, I will show you something about early versus late um, ART initiation. So these are just uh, 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 some of the points that I was mentioning, uh, daily treatment, try and use rifampicin whenever possible, uh, don't use a, a regimen without rifampicin. Look for drug interactions. With previous ART regimens, um, nevirapine was a drug that uh, was a no-no with uh, rifampicin. So we had to switch to efavirenz-based therapy. But now we've all mostly moved to uh, dolutegravir-based therapy. But again, with dolutegravir, we must remember to increase the dose of dolutegravir to a twice-daily dose when we give rifampicin. And also think of other opportunistic infections. So you can see here on my left, um, on top is the survival curve between early ART and later ART when the CD4 count is less than 50 and early versus late ART when the CD4 count is more than 50. You can clearly see that the maximum benefit is actually derived in patients whose CD4 count is less than 50. So in very advanced disease, starting ART early is very, very important. So these are the studies I was talking to you about, the SAPIT study, the STRIDE, the Camellia, the Temperano. If you sort of summarize all of these studies, what it shows us is that start ART within two weeks of, um, uh, of ATT, especially if the CD4 count is less than 50 cells. But look out for iris, as we mentioned, because it's a definite possibility. If your CD counts are, CD4 counts are higher, between 50 and 200, yes, you would still want to start early, and you will start anywhere between two and four weeks of therapy. Of course, if the CD4 counts are more than 200, um, still the dictum is to start as early as possible, but you would make sure that the underlying OI is under control. Um, maybe try to see if the pill burden reduces before starting ART. Only two disease conditions where we would defer ART to about four to six weeks 
One is tuberculous meningitis, because we are worried with the, uh, about the iris associated with TB meningitis. And the second is cryptococcal meningitis, where it's clearly shown that at least waiting for five weeks before starting ART has a survival benefit. So in all other opportunistic infections and in all other forms of TB except TB meningitis, start ART as early as possible. And by that, we mean two weeks of um, ATT intake. What can we do to prevent this iris? Can empirical steroids avoid iris in HIV TB co-infection? And this was the PRED ART trial that came out in the uh, NEJM in 2018, where it looked at patients who had uh, TB who were going to initiate ART whose CD4 count was less than 100. They divided them into two categories, uh, gave placebo to one group and gave prednisolone 40 mg for 14 days, followed by 20 mg per day for 14 days. So 28 days of steroids um, in one group and just placebo in the other group. And uh, what it showed was that um, definitely, if you look at this, um, this graph and this uh, survival curve, you can definitely see that the prednisolone arm definitely showed a reduction in the TB associated iris at 12 weeks. So prednisolone given upfront at the time of uh, ART initiation does reduce the uh, risk of iris in those who have TB who are going to initiate ART. Drug interactions, very important to look for. I mentioned nevirapine. We don't use nevirapine at all these days, so we don't have to worry. So we cannot use nevirapine with rifampicin, and we have to switch nevirapine to efavirenz. Uh, protease inhibitors, also we should not use rifampicin, try to switch to rifabutin. And now that we're using a lot of integrase inhibitors, such as dolotegravir, we need to ensure that dolotegravir is given as a double dose when we actually use uh, rifampicin in the, um, in the regimen. So with that, I will I come to the end of my talk. Uh, my take home messages for, the, for, for, for today are, um, when you want to screen somebody who has HIV for TB, use a, a four symptom screen and a chest X-ray. Um, if all are negative, um, the negative predictive value is quite good to roll out TB. Um, different diagnostic modalities are available for TB, but newer molecular diagnostics, especially expert ultra, seem to be you know, the diagnostic modality of choice. ATT treatment is daily, and the duration is very similar to the non-HIV setting. Uh, in patients who have TB, ART should be started early, um, especially in those whose CD4 count is less than 50, and that, by that we mean by two weeks. Steroids may help prevent uh, or avert iris and high-risk high patients. And whenever you're starting therapy for TB and HIV, watch out for drug-drug interactions. So I will stop there, and uh, I will be happy to take any questions um, regarding this topic. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Any queries may be asked in the chat box. We have two queries. Yeah, uh, one query is regarding the uh, IGRA or tuberculin skin test for surveillance of tuberculosis in HIV, sir. So, I don't think uh, there's a role for you know surveillance uh, for, for for latent TB because as I put the numbers out, um, the 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 percentage of people who have latent TB is extremely high, and we don't need to do surveillance. It's now clear that. Um, you know, IPT or isoniazid preventive therapy is recommended for everybody with HIV. So I don't believe there's a role on doing IGRAs or tuberculin skin test just for the purpose of surveillance. It also has no role in the diagnosis of, you know, of tuberculosis in patients uh, with uh, TB and HIV. And uh, we now know that IPT is, you know, incorporated into the ART program. So isoniazid preventive therapy for everybody with HIV you know, irrespective of whether, whether they have an IGRA positivity or not, um, is what is uh, essential. Okay. So the next question also, I'll just read out, what about ART in iris to continue our stop? So majority of iris is mild, is mild to moderate at, at, at best. Uh, there will be some inflammatory sim uh, symptoms, uh, like increase in size of the lymph nodes, swelling, uh, fever, you know. So most irises can be managed by continuing the ART and uh, simple anti-inflammatory agents will, would help. 
Some of them require um, steroids to sort of tide over the inflammation. And as we heard about even giving steroids to avert iris, steroids can be used to treat iris also. So majority of the times we don't have to stop ART in iris, but in situations where where the situation uh, where, where the clinical response is one of exuberant inflammation and there is CNS involvement such as TB meningitis or cryptococcal meningitis, in the rare situation we would have to stop, especially if the iris is very, very severe and likely to be life-threatening. But most of the times um, by you know treating the uh, OI and anti-inflammatories or steroids, the iris usually subsides. So I would not stop ART in iris except in certain situations where it is likely to be organ or life-threatening. Right. Uh, there is one direct question from Mr. Sagar Chandra. How good is TrueNet when compared with GeneXpert Ultra in TB detection since government of India is favoring it recently, especially in the smear negative, HIV positive, and pediatric age group? TrueNet versus uh, GeneXpert Ultra uh, in smear negative, HIV positive, and pediatric age group. I didn't get the question. Is the question that the gene ultra is better than, than the gene expert? Uh, true net versus gene expert ultra in TB detection. Okay, true net versus um, gene expert ultra. No, I, 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 I have not seen that 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 head to head comparison. And I think what is important for us is uh, we need to understand that um, whatever molecular diagnos diagnostics we use are going to be the backbone of making a diagnosis of tuberculosis. We need to move away from using our you know, age-old uh, sputum smears and things like that. Of course, culture will remain the gold standard, but we know that culture takes takes time. So I, I, I'm not aware of that head-to-head, -head, but molecular diagnostics are the way forward, be it gene expert, gene expert ultra, true nat. So uh, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with using any of them, uh, but the data, large data cohorts are from using gene expert ultra. Thank you so much, sir, for your talk. Uh, uh, we will be moving to our next talk. The next talk will be by Dr. Akshata. Dr. Akshata is our DMID resident, and she will be discussing about cryptococcus and HIV. Uh, Dr. Akshata. Thank you, sir. So I'm audible, right? You are audible. Yes. So, good evening, everyone. So, today now let's talk about cryptococcus and what's new in it. So, I would like to begin with a case a 32 year male PLHA patient who was diagnosed on 2013 and was on TLE. 2017 onwards, he stopped the treatment on its own. He now presents to us with history of weight loss, headache, nausea, and vomiting for past two weeks. And he comes, he uh, says to have that. Uh, headache has worked worsened over the past few days. There is no history of fever, chills, or any visual changes. Why his vitals are stable? On examination, there is neck rigidity. CSF analysis showed protein of 44, glucose of 52, and cell counts of 27, which were all lymphocytes. And uh, other parameters, CSF, KFT, LFT, were within the normal limits. So with these... Uh, with this case scenario, what would be your differentials and what are the further tests you would like to do? So you can answer it in the poll. Okay. So with this, the patient is a PLHA patient presenting to us with history of headache uh, and the neck rigidity with features suggestive of uh, meningitis. So your differentials would be your acute meningitis, which could be TB, viral, cryptococcal, uh, or, and uh, other in the back of the mind, you'll also have to keep our toxoplasmosis, syphilis, and CNS lymphoma. So obviously the other investigations are targeting the CSF. You can do the CBNAT, your cryptococcal antigen, India, and the viral uh, panel, as well as your CT or MRI. So the topic I'll be discussing under these headings, disease spectrum, diagnosis and treatment, 
management of raised ICT and treatment failure and what's new. So in order to understand any disease, we need to understand the underlying pathogenesis. So basically, cryptococcus is, I mean, cryptococcus is a, a basidium mycet, which is present ubiquitously and found worldwide. So the mode of uh, transmission is basically by the inhalational route. So on inhalation, the basidiospores or the yeast cells are inhaled and reaches the alveoli. The alveolar macrophages then engulf it and triggers the cytokine release, which will cause a TH1 response, which will lead to formation of uh, granulomatous inflammation. So the further course of the disease depends upon whether the patient is immunocompetent or immunocompromised. So in a patient who is immunocompetent, uh, the, either it can undergo two courses, that is the uh, yeast cells can be completely destroyed. In a patient who is immunocompromised, so the, the, there will be further propagation of these cells, yeast, and then there will be dissemination via the blood, and it can disseminate to various uh, uh, different organs, and uh, most commonly your CNS. And one more important part, that is a more major majority of the patients will have uh, a response in the pulmonary, where the, the, there will be a granulomatous inflammation and these crypto E cells will be lying latent in form of pulmonary nodules or just lymphadenopathy, which can again further if the patient in the further course of the disease, if the patient becomes immunocompromised, can undergo reactivation. So why is this important? So if the patient is having just pulmonary cryptococcus, so you'll have to uh, uh, the disease path and the pathogenesis will be in the only the confined to the lung. So diagnostic tests you will be confining to that specimen. So once the dissemination happens, that is, it is after the pulmonary symptoms, there will be the hematogenous spread where you will be expecting the cryptococcal antigenemia. And once the dissemination, that is, once it reaches the CNS, then you will be getting the CSF positivity. So that is spectrum involves your pulmonary, which uh, pulmonary and CNS are the most common areas which can be involved in the HIV patients. Apart from that, other sites of infection can be skin, prostate, and eye. And when, when a few of the patients can present with cryptococcus in any of the organs uh, and few of the patients who are having very low CD4 counts will have disseminated infection uh, involving multiple sites. So how do we best diagnose and treat and monitor the patients of cryptococcus? So the diagnosis basically depends on the clinical features, radiological and microbiological evidence. So coming to the clinical features, so the CNS, as I mentioned, the most common symptom, especially in patients who are immunocompromised, remains to be the headache. So most of these patients will not mount any fever. So any PLHA patient in the follow-up always asks for the history of uh, presence of any headache. So these patients will have subacute uh, long-standing headache which will be the presenting initial features of CNS cryptocol uh, meningitis. Then other features, uh, rare features, which can patient can present to you with is cranial neuropathies, alteration of consciousness, lethargy, seizures, etc. Acute pulmonary cryptococcus is also known. Uh, in, these, in this condition, the patient can present with fever, productive cough, dyspnea, chest, um, chest pain, weight loss, and fatigue. So this, uh, these symptoms are nonspecific and quite often they mimic other diseases like especially your TB and your PCP pneumonia. And sometimes the patient may present with acute respiratory failure. Uh, in HIV patient especially, there, there can be cutaneous manifestation that is most probably mostly due to the dissemination of the disease. Sometimes it can be due to the direct inoculation. And these lesions are confusing because uh, they appear to be uh, uh, they are usually the pap uh, papules or macules with the central umbilication. So hence, it can be mistook for your molluscum contagiosum lesions. So what is the importance of prostate? So the prostate uh, uh, involvement, especially in HIV patient, it acts as a reservoir of your cryptococcus, and this can lead to the uh, uh, relapse of the pa uh, relapse in the patients. So next, coming to the radiological features. Uh, so uh, CNS cryptococcus is the most common form, and they usually present with three major. Uh, uh, this one, so one of first common, most common one is the uh, pachymeningeal enhancement. And in cases of CNS uh, um, cryptococcus, it is recommended that MRI is better over CT scan because of more than fifty percent of the patients may have normal CT scan as well. 
the next the characteristic one is the dilated virtue of uh, robin spaces basically these are seen when the e cells are because of the large capsule once they invade they will cause a dilatation of this virtual robin spaces which can be appreciated in terms of multiple cystic lesions especially in the basal ganglia then uh, some of the patients can have just multiple small nodules especially these cryptococcomas are more better appreciated over the mri next coming to the pulmonary cryptococcus it is a great mimicker so it can present as single nodule multiple nodules uh, and miliary it can present as a miliary pattern which can mimic tb and patients in ards will mimic the mimic that of pcp and most of these cases pulmonary cryptococcus are asymptomatic and especially in hiv patients co concomitant infections are common that is patient may have both pulmonary as well as cns involvement and what if the patient is having just pulmonary involvement and you you do the serum cryptococcal antigen testing they are usually negative as i mentioned in the pathogenesis so first in first and foremost the first site of infection is the lung then it will spread to the other organs in that situation bal is a good sample where you can do the testing of cryptococcal antigen last uh, last one that is a microbiological diagnosis so that you can subject the patients uh, the sample to direct examination so that is the india in so you can subject the csf bal etc for this one you can appreciate the yeast cells uh, uh, with a large capsule so next is the histopathological examination so here you will be able to appreciate yeast cell which are around 4 to 5 micrometer with the a narrow base budding with a clearing around the e cell and culture culture remains a gold standard but uh, uh, and this is one of the e cell which can grow faster and uh, higher the load in the patient uh, the faster or the larger is the colony count and uh, the drawback of the culture is again it will take one may take one to two weeks and the pro important thing is it can be used for prognostication that is higher the uh, if there is a increase in the colony count uh, when the patient is on therapy there is a higher chances of mortality india inc uh, again it has low sensitivity and again depends on the observer cryptococcal antigen test remains the uh, uh, tri uh, the diagnostic of choice so there are two forms cryptococcal latex agglutination as well as cryptococcal lateral flow assay both have good sensitivity and specificity Uh, but a cryptococcal latex agglutination is not available everywhere, and it is quite expensive. Whereas cryptococcal antigen lateral flow assay is a point of care test, and it is easy and less expensive. And uh, and one important thing to note is you should always look ask for the cryptococcal titers. So the titers uh, again the LFA titers slightly higher than that of the latex agglutination titers. And if the titers are more than one is to six forty. then you should assume disseminated infection irrespective of the symptoms so coming back to the first case so the patient cd4 count was found to be 57 hiv viral load was uh, 15500 and india inc was positive and cryptococcal antigen positive with ct scan was normal so what you will be doing next the treatment so the uh, the international treatment guidelines this is basically by the who Uh, recommends the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. There is three phases. So the induction phase uh, is where the you will be trying to reduce the cryptococcal burden and increase the patient survival. And the treatment or uh, the first line of therapy, the choice is liposomal amphetericin B plus by uh, uh, flu cytosine. And uh, this one should be continued up to two weeks plus clinical improvement. Next is the consolidation phase where you it will be given for eight weeks and that is a fluconazole four hundred to eight hundred mg depending upon the burden of the disease. Last is the maintenance phase which is continued for six to twelve months that is again fluconazole two hundred mg and it will be stopped once the patient is on an effective ART his viral loads are undetected for three months and the CD four count is more than hundred. So our patient was started on liposomal amphotericin B and fluoxetine, which is one of the alternative regimen. So, what is the preferred induct uh, preferred therapy for induction phase according to the WHO? So this is a polling question. So I request all of you to answer the poll. Okay. 
due to shortage of time, I'll be ending the poll now. So most of you have uh, uh, given the answer as Amphosep for two weeks. Uh, so the, this, the WHO has updated that, uh, the, updated the, this document where in 2018, uh, they have up, uh, the therapy of choice remains to be amphotericin B plus 5 full cytosine for one week. Why? This was based on this trial, at the trial, so which were, where they have seen that uh, the amphotericin B one week or the two weeks had no uh, difference in the mortality. And why amphotericin plus flu cytosine is the first choice because of this. So there was a higher mortality in the fluconazole compared to 5 flu cytosine, that is 24% versus 49%. And hence, uh, the WHO first uh, line regimen remains to be amphotericin plus flu cytosine. This paved way for further studies. This is the ambition phase two, uh, uh, phase two in non inferiority uh, trial. So here, uh, they have tried to reduce the uh, course further. So what they have seen is they have compared the single dose, two dose, and the three dose. So here they have seen the mortality was uh, lesser in patients who were given single dose as well as two doses. So this paved way for the study, which most of you will be familiar with, that is the ambition phase three non-inferiority trial which was based on single dose liposomal amphotericin B for the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis, which was released in NEGM uh, last in the March, in the month of March. So here they have com compared uh, the experimental regimen that is a single IV inclusion of high dose liposomal amphotericin B, that is 10 mg per kg, followed by oral flu cytosine and oral fluconazole with the control regimen that is a WHO standard one week of amphotericin B plus flu cytosine followed by fluconazole regimen. The study, the results were that uh, they found that the absolute difference they had, there uh, was the mortality was much lesser in the uh, experimental group, that is a uh, single dose of single high dose liposomal amphotericin compared to the control. And even the adverse effects profile was much lower in the liposomal amphotericin compared to the control. So based on this, the WHO will be updating the guidelines. So they have released a document. The guidelines will be updated uh, in the next uh, few weeks where they'll be reg uh, uh, recommending this single dose, single high dose regimen for cryptococcal meningitis. So this is a brief about the treatment. So when the patient is having both pulmonary and CNS cryptococcus, how are you going to treat? So you'll be treating just like the CNS meningitis, which I've discussed before. If the patient is having severe pulmonary cryptococcus or serum LFA is more than 1 is to 64, that is when you will be assuming the dissemination. Again, so you should be treating as per the that of uh, CNS cryptococcus. If the patient is having mild to moderate pulmonary cryptococcus or asymptomatic pulmonary cryptococcus, you can just uh, go do away with just fluconazole regimen, that is initial 400 to 800 for 800 mg for 10 weeks, followed by 200 mg for 6 to 12 weeks. Other non-CNS, non-pulmonary cryptococcus, fluconazole 400 mg for 6 to 12 months remains the treatment of choice. Isolated cryptococcal antigenemia. So again, this is a patient. So if a patient is presenting to you and you have done a cryptococcal antigen screening and it has turned out to be positive, so what are you going to do? It, uh, there is recommendation that you better start a preemptive therapy with fluconazole 400 to 800 mg OD for 10 weeks followed by 6 to 12 months of 200 uh, mg. So this was based on various studies where they have seen. So for the patients with asymptomatic crack positive have were associated with lower mortality. And in that also, if the patient was treated with fluconazole where uh, that preemptively were associated with lower mortality. And this is based on the fact that you are preventing the infection spread by treating it prior. So preemptively, you're going to treat. So with this, I have the next question. A 26-year-old male truck driver by occupation presents with severe headache, nausea, vomiting. He had uh, on examination, neck rigidity was present with uh, sixth cranial deficit. That is CT and CT scan was within normal limit. Cryptococcal antigen titer was 1 is to 320. And LP opening pressure is 38 centimeter of water and he was detected to be HIV positive. So what is the most appropriate next step? Again, this is a polling question. Please answer. So uh, this is a very important question. It will address many important things, whether you just have to manage the raised ICT, whether you'll just start the patient on fluconazole or whether you will give fluconazole with steroid 
or just uh, you uh, I mean you'll give the standard regimen with steroid or just the standard regimen or you'll standard regimen with the starting of art uh, okay so let's end up poll yes uh, majority of you have got it correct so the patient so the pa any patient with uh, uh, meningitis it is a life threatening uh, situation so you will have the antimicrobial management comes first so you will have to start the patient on the standard treatment that is liposomal amphotericin and flucytosin and what is the issue, issue with the steroid and starting of art let me discuss further so how do we manage raise ict so there are, the recommendation says that there is a role of therapeutic lp whenever the patient is having symptoms of uh, uh, symptoms or signs of raised icp and if the if it is more than 25 cm of water the, the lp daily can also be done evd and vp shunts can also be considered and one important thing to note here is there is no requirement that the csf should be sterile before you place the evd and there is no role of steroid or acetazolamide in management of raised icp especially in, in these patients with cryptococcal meningitis why this was based on this uh, study adjunctive dexamethasone in hiv associated cryptococcal meningitis uh, it, here they have seen that, that with the dexamethasone there was higher mortality of around 47% and this trial was stopped in between with a hazard ratio of 1.18 so in patients with cryptococcal meningitis steroid should not be given so next important question is when do you want to restart the art so the patient had stopped the art so now when do you want to restart the art again this is a polling question please answer there are two questions Okay. Let's end the poll here. Okay. So most most of you after induction phase and uh, for the first one, so that is in cryptococcal meningitis. Next is just a case of cryptococcal antigenemia, mixed response. So let me try to make it clear here. So any patient with cryptococcal meningitis, a delayed start is recommended. That is a start ART after four to six weeks of antifungal treatment. And why was this? This was based on this study. Effect of early versus deferred antiretroviral initiation in HIV infected cryptococcal meningitis. So they, as you can see, there was higher mortality in patients who were initiated with early ART compared to deferred ART, that is four to six weeks. And this is a recommendation by the WHO uh, that immediate ART initiation is not recommended because it was associated with higher mortality and it should be deferred by four to six weeks from the initiation. And for other forms of cryptococcosis, ART can be delayed for two to four weeks. So the other answer was two to four weeks, two weeks. So coming back to the case one, now the blood and CSF culture grew cryptococcus neoformance. Repeat LP done at the end of two weeks was found, you have found that cryptococcal antigen is positive. So what would you like to do now? So whether you want to uh, retreat the patient, what type, whether is, a, is this a relapse or a treatment failure? So no, cryptococcal antigen should not be used for monitoring the patient. It may, because it can remain positive for many years. This was uh, done, uh, clinical utility, it was uh, evident from the study, clinical utility of monitoring serum cryptococcal antigen done by Abbott et al. Next scenario would be repeat LP done at the end of two weeks has grown cryptococcus neoformance. Then what would you like to do? So this brings us to the topic of treatment failure. So this could be a case of treatment failure if it is happening before less than uh, four weeks. So that uh, treatment failure is defined as lack of clinical improvement and continued positive culture after the induction phase. Uh, then relapses, recurrence of symptoms, with a positive CSF culture after four weeks. So what are you going to do first? First, you should always look for the whether the patient is having fluconazole resistance. And this patient, you will be restarting the induction phase. And at the end of re one week of reinduction phase, you will again do the CSF culture and verify that it is sterile. Or the culture has become sterile. And after the induction phase, you will be giving the fluconazole at a higher dose. That is the main, uh, the consolidation phase, you will be giving a higher dose of 1200 mg. And in cases of relapse, you should always try to 
optimize the ART. In refractory uh, cases, that is, if the patient is still having persistent uh, cryptococcus growth, then you can consider adjective immunological therapy with recombinant interferon gamma. So last topic, what is new? So is there a role, is there anything for or, uh, root oral amphotericin B? So phase one ENAC trial, uh, which uh, this brought to us one of the oral amphotericin B, that is the encochleated amphotericin B. So what do you mean by encochleated? So basically it is, it is nothing but uh, the amphotericin B is uh, hidden in between the phosphatidyl serine bilayer and the calcium ions as shown in this picture. And uh, so what happens? So the, these, uh, the, uh, so in the oral route, when the patient consumes it orally, uh, the, there is, uh, the drug is prevented from denaturation by the gastric acid because of this uh, mechanism. So once it reaches the host site, uh, the targeted site, the macrophage will engulf this encochleated amphotericin B. And because the uh, encochleated amphotericin B has higher calcium compared to that of the uh, macrophage in intracellular contents of the macrophage, the calcium ions will come out. And once it happens, the amphotericin uh, is, B is released intracellularly. So phase one was done to assess the safety, tolerability, and bioavailability. It was now found to have good bioavailability. So it proceeded to the phase two trial, and this was by the Martinez Biopharma. Uh, the results of this trial is still awaited. So basically they had uh, uh, divided into four cohorts uh, in which one of the cohort had just uh, were given the oral, total oral route for 14 days. In this, uh, they have found that cohort two, that is why the cohort which was administered IV amphotericin plus flu, five flu cytosine for two days followed by 13 days of oral, had a higher than projected um, uh, early fungicidal activity and good overall survival, survival rate of more than 95% with no evidence of renal toxicity or tolerability issue. Last topic is the COVID-associated cryptococcus, that is khaki. As we all know, COVID-19 has brought to us like other, uh, like most commonly the mucormycosis as well as aspergillosis. Now they have started investigating and they have found that COVID-19 uh, because of the uh, pro-inflammatory release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, there was increased susceptibility to fungal infection. And because of giving prolonged steroids immunomodulator therapy, there can be activation of the latent pulmonary cryptococcus, which can lead to infection. And this, in this report, they have reported 13 cases of which majority were the, uh, the site where the lung. And so we will always have to be uh, we have to look forward, look for where if the patient is not improving clinically uh, after even after the immunomodulatory therapy, we should always have a lookout for this. So, and we ending the talk. So, can we prevent cryptococcus? No, because it's a ubiquitous organism. It is present everywhere. You can't prevent it. So, we can prevent the disease. How can we prevent the disease by early HIV diagnosis, early initiation of ART, and in patients who are having. Uh, uh, CD4 less than 100, you will do the routine tracks uh, screening. Primary prophylaxis is not recommended. That is giving fluconazole for all the patients who are HIV positive is not recommended by the WHO. Instead, it is a preemptive therapy that is by detecting uh, the cryptococcal antigen, you can do the uh, treatment. And once the patient is uh, diagnosed to have cryptococcal meningitis, optimal management by combination fungal antifungal therapy, management of raised ICP and initiation of ART in appropriate duration and always detecting and treating persistent and relapse cases. So thank you. That's it. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Akshita. Uh, it was a interactive session and Dr. Akshita is active on online and we are also uh, telecasting this on YouTube with Learn with Akshita channel and she is actively involved in teaching and learning in this. Uh, the answers to any queries can be given on the chat box because there is uh, some deficiency of time. Our next talk will be by Dr. Yash. He will be talking on pneumocystis pneumonia in HIV diagnosis and management. Dr. Yash is our DMID student. He will be presenting a case also, Dr. Yash.
so uh, thank you sir am i audible so yeah, uh, yeah. good evening to all uh, now i am going to speak about a very important topic uh, that is diagnosis and management of uh, hi uh, pneumocystis pneumonia and hiv so while speaking about hiv uh, if we do not mention pneumocystis pneumonia it is a felony of uh, high grade because pneumocystis pneumonia is a uh, forbearer of the hiv pandemic the first case of uh, hiv was diagnosed because of the pneumocystis pneumonia as we all know about it so uh, just a minute okay so speaking about some historical fact so carlo chagas was the first to discover this microorganism in 1989 while he was studying the trypanosomiasis patients and he considered it as a trypanosomial life cycle stage he even made the sketch about it you can see uh, upper this circles are actually the pneumocystial stages which he thought that it was a trypanosomal stages so from there only the uh, patient uh, like the uh, protozoal or origin of the uh, cryptococcus was considered in 1912 husband and wife team of delanoy identified it as a separate organism and they christened it as pneumocystis carinae Uh, on the name of their beloved professor about carinae so later studies found the presence of host specific species within the genus pneumocystis yes me. it yes it is not yeah, uh, the slides, slides. Uh, again reshare no stop sharing and then again this year In the time we get this, I would like to answer this question on Dr. Shita's presentation about uh, uh, liposomal or amphotericin deoxyphorate. Liposomal amphotericin definitely is uh, safer. Uh, otherwise, there is no issue with the potency, and the dose has already been discussed in the presentation. I hope Dr. Yash is ready. Screen. This one, sir. Slides are changing. No, yes, slide is still not changing. I think we are having some. Difficulty with Dr. Yash presentation, so he will be doing it after Dr. Deepak's presentation. So I will request Dr. Deepak to present on HIV and IRS. Dr. Deepak. Thank you, sir. Ah, uh, uh, am I audible and visible? uh am i audible sir uh yes dr deepak you are audible ha uh, uh, good evening to everyone so uh we will going to discuss a brief about how to differentiate the iris from the ois and uh, as all we know the early initiation of art is the cornerstone of the improving um, the quality of life and reducing the morbidity and mortality of hiv as well as the spread of the hiv but however this early initiation is not without the risk and it is associated with some complication and the uh, iris or immune uh, reconstitution inflammatory syndrome which is also known as ird or immune reconstitution disease which is occurs especially in patients who is receiving early initiation of art with a considerable morbidity and mortality 
So what is iris? Iris basically, uh, as uh, Dr. Rajiv Kartik sir said, is an exuberant immune response, and it is an immune recovery following the initiation of the ART, and it is associated with a pathological inflammatory response, uh, usually directed toward the microbial pathogen. And uh, the uh, important feature that iris has uh, very heterogeneous condition or have very heterogeneous clinical features. and it is differ from patient to patient and pathogen to pathogen also and uh, french et al has reported the first case of the iris with the jadavudin monotherapy uh, related with the mycobacterium avium intracellular infection so iris is basically uh, two type the uh, one is paradoxical iris and second is unmasking iris uh, uh, any ois uh, detected and Uh, treatment has started, and after the initiation uh, of ART with a certain time period, the uh, again deterioration uh, of the patient is considered as the paradoxical iris. And the important differentials of this paradoxical iris is the uh, drug-related toxicity or drug resistance with related to OIs or newer OIs and poor adherence to therapy. And second is the unmasking iris as the patients. Uh, uh not having any sign and symptom of the any uh, disease but after the initiation of the art patient developed uh, clinical deterioration or a new onset diseases that is uh, uh, considered as the uh, uh, unmasking iris and the important differentials are again new ois is very important differences of unmasking iris so there is a lot of definitions has been given as we have said it is a heterogeneous disease so uh, of initial definition is given by french et al in 2004 and they said that <clears throat> for diagnosis of iris we require either two major criteria or one major plus two minor criteria in the major criteria first is the atypical presentation of ois or tumor uh, in patients which initially responded with art and now presented with the localized uh, disease with ex uh, exaggerated inflammatory reactions or a typical response and second uh, major criteria is the decrease uh, of the plasma hiv rna level more than 1 log 10 copies per ml and the minor criteria is increased cd4 count after art increase an in immune response specific uh, that relevant to the pathogen and spontaneous resolution of disease with continuation of art and uh, robertson et al again given a new definition in the 2006 that uh, classify the required and the supportive criteria again the required criteria is worsening of the inflammation and infection and temporal relation with the art and the symptoms which are not able to explain that particular disease and there is tremendous uh, decline in the viral load after initiation of art along with this there is an increase of cd4 count more than 25 and biopsy or red Uh, shows exuberant inflammatory response and lot more definitions in the uh, collaborant at all in 2016 and more de uh, de definitions has been given but none definition is found to be uh, uh, accurate because of the heterogeneity of the disease in the 2009 a study published in the clinical infectious disease has compare the french et al definition versus robertson et al definition and expert opinion and in these expert opinion they have used 11 uh, points to diagnose the iris and in which they have uh, enrolled 498 patient and monitor for initial 6 months of art for the iris and total 620 events uh, occurred among them with the case definition one or with the french at all only 24% positive agreement was made with the expert opinion while with the robertson at all there is 78% agreement has been made it means the none of the definition is found to be uh, 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 very much sensitive for diagnosis of irises and they have given the new definition by their study for the paradoxical iris and unmasking iris separately in the paradoxical iris they have given the clinical criteria is first is the the relation with the initiation of the art and second is the worsening deterioration worsening or deterioration or reappearance of the symptoms with the initiation of the art along with this very important is the exclusion of the other causes as we have already discussed exclusion of the drug toxicity exclusion of the drug resistant oi exclusion of the adherence uh, regarding the adherence of the therapy and finally uh, uh, the Uh, after this exclusion we can made the diagnosis of paradoxical iris uh, similarly with the unmasking iris there is a 
uh, initially patient not having symptom, but with the temporal relation with the ART, patient develops new onset infection of inflammatory response. And these uh, can be up to three, three months. And uh, these are the basically atypical or exaggerated response. Along with this, also there's the exclusion of the drug toxicity and new OIs is important. So there is no uh, definitive or clear-cut definition regarding the iris. If we are looking to the epidemiology of iris, there is a large uh, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis published in the Lancet Infectious Disease in 2010 by Muller et al. And they have included 54 cohort mm -hmm. study among, among 13,000 patients and around 15% patient developed the iris. And they found that CMV retinitis was the most common iris followed by the cryptococcal meningitis, then tuberculosis and PML. And the lethality related with the iris is found to be around 4.5% and which is highest with the cryptococcal meningitis. They had found that around 20 to 30% mortality is related with the cryptococcal meningitis related iris. And especially if it focus to the low or middle income country, we can see the tuberculosis iris is around 10% and while cryptococcal iris is around 20% and most of the studies are related to the India. Similar uh, meta-analysis also present regarding the TB iris, specifically TB iris in the HIV. And uh, they found uh, the pool estimated inc incidence was 18%. And the common uh, uh, iris feature in these patients are pulmonary and related to the lymph node. And uh, around one fourth of the patients uh, required a, a repeated uh, a readmission and hospitalization and most of the patients are using a corticosteroid uh, and the case fatality rate was found to be 7% but is basically all cause mortality but death attributed to TB iris they have found only 2%. So the iris is not uncommon condition and the, but the fatality is not, not very much high but there is a case fatality rate with the iris. So if we are looking to the risk factor, what are the common risk factors that are associated with the iris? is uh, some post related, some pathogen related and some treatment related factor of any I patient having know. very uh, low CD4 count at the initiation of ART or having some particular genetic predisposition or patient having poor immune response to the OI. Along with this, if there is a uh, uh, disseminated disease or high HIV viral load at the time of presentation and there is a shorter duration between the initiation of the OI treatment and initiation of ART that followed by the rapid fall in the HIV viral load. So these are the common risk factors that are commonly associated with the iris. Uh, if we are uh, going to discuss about the, what is the pathogenesis of iris, the exact pathogenesis is still under uh, the area of the research, but patients with the certain risk factor, which we have discussed that low CD4 with the disseminated OI and poor immune response, with the high burden of the uh, uh, this uh, disease, the initiation of AIT will lead to the exorbitant immune response. And this exorbitant immune response or dysfunction immune response basically lead to the release of accessory, excessive pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this release of these excessive pro-inflammatory cytokines is basically responsible for the signs and symptoms of the iris. And this pro Planetary response is related to both innate as well as the acquired immunity. Both are responsible for this. If you are looking to the pathogenesis that is related to the TB iris, the high burden of the mycobacterium is engulfed by the macrophages, but these macrophages are not able to kill these mycobacterium and they send the response uh, uh, with the help of interleukin 12 to the both uh, CD4 cells as well as the uh, uh, neutrophils and NK cells. And these uh, uh, inflammatory response uh, uh, with the initiation of ART that lead to the aberrant TH1 cells re response. And they have released excess of the uh, cytokines and chemokines in the form of interferon gamma and interleukin 17, as well as there's a, re a recruitment of more and more the neutrophil. And all these uh, exaggerated or exorbitant immune response ultimately lead to the tissue damage in the patient of iris. So both innate as well as adaptive immune response is responsible for the iris and it is different in the different type of the pathogens and enhancement of the TH1 response in the form of interleukin 17, 18 interferon gamma and the recruitment of the NK cells and neutrophil cells are basically the responsible for the pathogenesis of iris. And so because of this pro-inflammatory uh, response of the iris, uh, 
lot of uh, biomarkers has been postulated for iris in the form of crp interferon gamma interleukin interleukin and tnf alpha and d dimers there are studies that found that crp are uh, raised in the patients uh, with the pre treatment patients of paradoxical as well as that masking iris but uh, none of found to be very much sensitive for the diagnosis of the iris so we'll going to discuss few case regarding the iris so this patient is admitted with us with a 55 year old male with the diagnosed case of hiv presented with the complaint with the fever and we have diagnosed with the pulmonary tb as well as the tb meningitis both and the cb nat was found to be positive with no rifampicin resistance and the mri uh, brain was done that shows multiple tuberculoma or granuloma so the patient was initiated initially on the art with certain period of time we have started on art and discharge patient with the good clinical condition after the two month patient again re admitted with complain of the headache and blurred vision we have again analyzed the patient the chf analysis shows the 300 cells predominantly these are the lymphomononuclears with the low sugars and high protein and mri brain of that time is suggestive of the enhance Uh, granuloma uh, or tuberculoma with increase in number as well as the size so uh, initially we can suspect this a case of iris uh, but we have to ruled out uh, the drug toxicity and drug resistance tuberculosis so we have investigated patients on further investigation the cb nat uh, was found to be negative culture wall also found to be negative and patients initiated on the low dose of the steroid so if you are looking to the tb iris the incidence is very much varied from 2 to 54% but indian institute are uh, presented the incidence of around 20 to 30% and the key risk factors which we have already discussed the shorter duration between the tb treatment initiation and art initiation or disseminated tb as our patient at the time of presentation and low cd4 count at the time of presentation and most of the patients are presented with the dinner a uh, uh, period of 3 months and the important differences we have already discussed the drug resistant tb the drug toxicity and other oi and poor adherence of the therapy should be ruled out before uh, coming to the diagnosis of the iris and this is basically the case of paradoxical iris and both culture as well as the molecular based test in the form of gene expert should be done uh, to rule out the drug resistance and other oi it should be ruled out and uh, if patient having significant symptom prednisolone with the dose of 1.5 mg per kg for 14 days followed by uh, 0.75 mg uh, per kg for 14 days uh, can be given and that will reduce the symptom we have given this steroid to the patient and patient improved with the time uh, this again prednisolone can be used to prevent the this iris as dr rajiv kartik sir already discussed that this trial has published in the 2018 in the nagm and they found the prednisolone uh, uh, group is compared with the placebo in a patients who have high risk of iris and the prednisolone is in initiated preemptively and they found that uh, uh, incidence of iris is significantly lower in uh, patients who are using prednisolone as compared to the placebo but the major drawback of this study is they did not uh, Uh, check for the motility between the groups and again the presence of prednisolone is associated with a higher risk of other oi is again also not uh, examined in this study so use of prednisolone for the treatment and prevention of iris should be cautiously so in the second case this is a 50 year old male presented with the fever headache and a diffuse skin lesion so i did not have the picture and there is a non case of hiv not taking the art on investigation the serum cryptococcal antigen was positive and on csf analysis the ndi ink was positive fungal culture for the blood as well as the skin as well as the csf all grew the cryptococcus and the, the disseminated cryptococcus with plhiv the diagnosis has been made and patient was initiated on the two week of the liposomal therapy with the fluconazole as the flu cytosine is was not available and with the eight week of the fluconazole and patient was discharged after this uh, 10 weeks on the oral fluconazole and art with that time the tle was the drug of the choice and a patient again was readmitted again after 30 days with the worsening of the headache as well as the skin lesion and that time uh, patients readmitted and the csf uh, and blood culture was sent and repeat examination was done but that found to be negative for the cryptococcus but antigen was found to be positive so so we made the diagnosis of the uh, this uh, cryptococcal uh, iris and we have Readjusted this fluconazole, uh, 
fluconazole dose to the 800 to 1200 milligram and we have done repeated lp to reduce uh, his headache and uh, finally after two weeks of the therapy he improved and discharged on the fluconazole and uh, i think it is two years of this therapy patient is absolutely fine on follow up so regarding the cryptococcal iris the incidence is slightly higher than the uh, this tb iris and they again these are mainly associated with patients with the fungemia or high cryptococcal titer or patients with the uh, low uh, immune response against the cryptococcal uh, cryptococcal uh, pathogen and the onset can be up to 12 month and the median duration is around 4 to 6 week and the important differentials if the culture found to be positive the fluconazole resistance should be ruled out as discussed by dr akshata so and the csf culture should be sent and if culture is found to be negative the uh, uh, cryptococcal iris should be suspect and as dr akshata said cryptococcal antigen should not be used for the monitoring and uh, further uh, follow up of the diagnosis of the cryptococcal meningitis as well as the diagnosis of the iris and like the tb iris the steroid has no role as the dr akshata said that it is associated with a higher mortality so optimization and strengthening of the antifungal therapy is the main choice of the cryptococcal iris and the uh, steroid can be used in the severe or refractory cases we'll discuss later so we'll discuss the third case is a 33 year old uh, truck driver basically presented with the evaluation of the ald other they know the symptom and recently diagnosed with the pnhiv and we have done the viral load which is found to be very high and patient was initiated on tld and almost all ois are ruled out before initiation of tld and after 10 days patient again presented with the history of the right sided progressive weakness agitated behavior giddiness and low grade fever and focal seizure since one days and the mri was done that time and that is uh, suggestive of the Uh, the subcortical deep white matter enhancement and which is uh, in the favor of pml so there is a, uh, a, a dilemma has occurred that either it is a pml or it is a pml iris so uh, we have uh, further evaluated the patient and the csf analysis shows there is a slight increase in cells most of them are the lymphomononuclears with the slight increase in the protein and other ois we have ruled out which is found to be negative other than the we have sent the jc uh, virus D, uh, pcr which is found to be positive so again the dilemma is still continue that is the iris or pml iris so we will discuss what are the few points that can easily differentiate pml from the pml iris which is generally it is occurs first weeks to month after the initiation of art the our patients is not having previous symptom and again develop symptom after initiation of art there is some contrast enhancement or mass effect can be seen with the pml if having pml iris generally pml do not having contrast enhancement and edema so our patient having mild contrast enhancement and generally the uh, csf wbc is generally uh, not raised in the patient of pml but it can be raised in a patient of pml iris the our patient having slightly raised wbc counts or advanced hiv or low cd4 count or a greater decline in the hiv viral load are the clues and our patient initially have very high viral load and we have repeat this viral load after 10 days that is found only 300 copies then again it is give a important clue regarding the pml iris and it can be unmasking or paradoxical basically in our case it is a unmasking iris and the use of steroid is i think uh, difficult and there is a no clear cut guideline to the use of steroid in the pml iris because again it is increase the risk of uh, deterioration of the disease but in this patient we have used the steroid for 7 days and patients uh, improved and we have discharged the patient we have asked patient to come in the follow up will repeat the mri on 2 to 6 week for the follow up so this is the basics about the some cases So when to stop ART? Is so I think already discussed by the doctor uh, uh, Rajiv sir that the uh, ART should not be interrupted in a patient of iris until unless there is a life-threatening issue. And the severe iris, for example, this is the uh, uh, pulmonary TB uh, or Mycobacterium TB, which is associated with the neurological complications or cryptococcal CNS cryptococcal meningitis or CMV retinitis, which is associated with the vision loss, are the considered as the severe iris. So only these condition we can stop the iris if it is think that these may be associated with the permanent disability of the patient. So the take home of the uh, uh, this uh, 
topic is that severe immunodeficiency, high HIV viral load at the time of initiation and rapid fall disseminated OI at the time of initiation of ART was uh, associated with the and uh, is associated with the uh, iris and the iris should be suspect in these cases and the rule out drug toxicity, drug resistance and new OIs before the reaching to the diagnosis of ART and ART, uh, sorry, uh, reaching to the diagnosis of iris and ART should not be stopped in iris until unless there is a severe and life-threatening situation. Uh, uh, thank you uh, all for uh, this uh, kind attention. And I would like to also thanks uh, my DM fellow, Dr. C. Wang, Dr. Subhasri and Dr. Aksatha to help me to be, be, make this presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Deepak for enlightening on this important topic. Uh, we apologize for the technical glitch that occurred in Dr. Yash's talk. Any questions to Dr. Deepak can be taken in the chat box where he will be more than happy to answer any of your queries. And now we will uh, request Dr. Yash to present his uh, talk. Really sorry for the interruption. Uh, so let's continue with the discussion of the nephrocystis pneumonia. Uh, uh, excuse me. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. So as I was talking that uh, Carlos Chagas was the first to discover the microorganism in 1989. And he thought that it was a tepanosomial stage and uh, uh, later on, by the husband and wife uh, uh, team of Delanois, they identified it as a separate organism. Yet they considered this uh, organism to be of protozoan origin. They called it as Pneumocystis carinae on the uh, name of their beloved professor about uh, carinae. So later studies found the presence of host specific species within the genus Pneumocystis. So Pneumocystis is a big genus in which various species are there. Human specific species was thus called as Pneumocystis gerovetzi. So that is how it is spelled, Yero uh, And uh, the Pneumocystis carinae uh, is the uh, species which uh, affects the rodent uh, major. So it took almost a century and genome sequencing to ascertain the fungal nature of the Pneumocystis species. So coming to the life cycle, the uh, intracellular uh, disease causing form of the Pneumocystis is asexual trophic form, which is basically haploid and resides inside the nucleus and the cytoplasm in different stages of the cycle. So, uh, once in a while, these uh, uh, stages uh, undergo haploid conjugation, uh, then undergo meiosis and early cyst formation. Uh, the eighth cell uh, cyst stage is the infective form of the pneumocystis in humans. Uh, how this, this pneumocystis is spread? The source of infection is reservoir. The asymptomatic carrier, uh, uh, the uh, immunocomponent host uh, at a time, some 20% uh, of the population is usually uh, acts as an asymptomatic carrier. And the carrier stage is acquired uh, in the early childhood only. So because it is a ubiquitous organism. So patient with PCP pneumonia, like PCP also are the uh, cause of the uh, uh, source of the infection. The period of transmission is almost three weeks before the diagnosis of PCP and until two weeks after the diagnosis. So there is a rational in isolating a active case of pneumocystis from the other HIV uh, patients. So after, as I already told, the cyst is the uh, infective form of the uh, disease. So total of entry, uh, entry is uh, respiratory tract and the route of transmission is airborne. So it can cause uh, infection or no infection depending upon the uh, clinical situation and the uh, immunity of the host. So coming to the case, a 22 year, uh, me, uh, year old male is a known case of PLHIV since childhood and treatment before the past five years. Presented with the complaints of significant weight loss over a month with a low grade fever and gradually increasing exertion dyspnea. For five days, having sore throat, cough, and scanty sputum, and resting dyspnea. On examination, he was emaciated, pale, and oral thrush was present. Blood pressure was 98 point by 54, pulse rate was 114 beats per minute, respiratory rate was 28 minutes, and respiratory distress signs were present. So the fever was there in this patient, and SPO2 address was 93%. So he is uh, dyspneic. In, in distress, on auscultation, reduced airflow bilaterally with occasional late inspiratory drafts. So, 
this is the uh, classical picture of uh, uh, the pcp uh, 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 cases when they present to you so uh, we can't jump to the diagnosis right away there are differentials to consider and these are the major differentials we should consider while uh, uh, keeping mind uh, uh, keeping in mind about the pcp at this pandemic era yes of course the uh, covid 19 infection has is a, of paramount importance and that has to be ruled out in the first place another important differential which is which is uh, necessary uh, uh, to uh, to be ruled out is pulmonary tuberculosis the co infection can occur and it is not that uncommon and there is a treatment ramification for that also because uh, we need to start art as early as possible in pneumocystis uh, pneumonia cases so if pulmonary tuberculosis co infection is there then we may have to delay, delay the uh, uh, art uh, therapy and this principle is vice versa like we have to rule out other co infections uh, pcp should always be ruled out uh, in the cases with pulmonary tb and other uh, opportunistic, opportunistic infection because again uh, we can keep on giving the treatment for other ois but uh, the treatment result might not be uh, coming so what are the clues the hypoxemia and raised ldh even after initiation of treatment is a clue that patient might be having pcp pneumonia underlying pcp uh, pcp uh, disease another uh, differentials which we are supposed to uh, keep in mind are histoplasmosis cryptococcus cytomegalovirus kaposi sarcoma like involvement and mycobacterium avium complex so this was the x ray for this patient you can see this is a uh, reticular uh, shadow majorly in the central part of the lungs this is a classical picture of classical chest x ray of uh, pneumocystis uh, pneumonia cases but though this is classical it is not the pathognomonic it is neither the specific so how to approach the pcp case we have to consider several things like when to suspect pcp what are the differentials how to investigate when to start treatment how to treat what is the role of art and when to consider prophylaxis so clinical features there is a classic triad that is subacute onset of exertion dyspnea which is called as otherwise called as door step dyspnea so door step by that uh, we mean that patient says that they are not able to uh, take it uh, take a deep breath like their breath has been stopped in between so they feel that uh, chest is full of something so that is called as door step dyspnea so dyspnea developing over weeks uh, in a hiv case uh, we have to write away think about the pcp uh, uh, underlying pcp so another thing is dry and non productive cough fever or sub febrile temperatures other findings are oral thrush weight loss retrosternal burning pain and stigmata of other ois so oral thrush and uh, weight loss uh, these two things are again uh, they are the four bearer of the pc underlying pcp uh, uh, pcp is more common in patients with oral thrush they uh, ultimately define that patient is severely uh, immuno uh, like uh, immuno competent uh, immuno compromised so sudden fulminant worsening is known to happen to the uh, pcp cases so all the pcp cases are serious cases and we have to take this thing in consideration even patient might be sitting well there can be chance that within one hour the patient can deteriorate he can start having hemoptysis uh, there is a chance that uh, there is a uh, pneumothorax sudden uh, onset of the pneumothorax so we should always consider a pcp case as a serious case other sites involvement are rare but uh, can occur up to in 3% of the patients uh, most frequently the lymph nodes spleen and liver and bone marrow are involved on physical examination patient can be hypoxic tachypneic and there can be presence of tachycardia these are the only sign uh, which uh, which uh, give us the idea about the underlying pcp inspiratory crackles but there is a catch that chest examination can be normal in up to 50% of the cases so clinical uh, suspicion is a key to the diagnosis and optimal treatment if patient is not hypoxemic at rest we can ask them to go for the walk test about for 3 minutes and 6 minutes uh, that may reveal the hypoxia and uh, that has to be done in every patient who says that uh, they are having exertion dyspnea to rule out the underlying pcp so what are the risk factors of pcp even in the hiv cases the degree of immunosuppression if cd4 counts are less than 200 cells per uh, millimeter of cube then they are at the high risk in older time we used to calculate the percentage also so less than 14% of the cd4 cells again is a risk factor previous episode of pcp oral thrush as i have told you already recurrent bacterial pneumonia unintentional weight loss and higher the hiv rna level more are the chances of pcp so what are the investigation how to investigate the case of pcp first thing first and foremost thing we have to do the abg so we have to consider 
uh, whether patient is having severity. The, we have to grade uh, the patient according to the severity. And alveolar to arterial gradient is key in this. So we have to go for the ABG at the first thing. This is the first thing we have to do. Another thing is chest X-ray. So classic is para, as I have already told you, parahyalur, bilateral, interstitial infiltrates, often uh, cystic lesion and cavity can be seen, and rarely pleural effusion, nodular granulomas, and pneumothorax. Presence of pneumothorax in HIV patient is a PCP until and uh, until proof otherwise. But again, 25% of the cases may have normal X-ray. For that, we have a rescuer that is CT chest. We should not shy away any time while uh, evaluating the HIV cases uh, and to send them this uh, uh, CT scan investigation. Bilateral ground glass opacity is the classical of the uh, CT finding in the PCP cases. Another thing which we have to consider is high LDH concentration and uh, which is the adjunctive and is associated with the severe disease. CD4 and HIV viral load to plan the profile axis, I will tell you later. And diffusion scan is another adjunctive. If diffusion scan is uh, more than the uh, diffusion of carbon monoxide is more than of 75%, then it effectively rules out, rule out the PCP. Other investigation we have to send to rule out other etiology, as I have already told you, it is very important. Co infections are known to uh, happen. So, this is a classic uh, CT scan finding of the PCP pneumonia. This is uh, uh, ground glass haze, you can see the red arrow here. And this one is a pneumocystic uh, 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 presentation on the X ray. Uh, here is a catch the cystic presentation on the X ray is not uh, by this uh, uh, organism is called as pneumocystis. It is because of this, some other reason. Staining is the gold standard. We have to understand that. Uh, PCP cannot be grown on the culture. So gold standard is staining and microscopy of ascus and tropic form. Deeper the sample, more is the sensitivity. And we can go for many uh, stains, but the Robert Gomery scan is the uh, most commonly used. And uh, there is a new scope for immunofluorescence microscopy, which increases sensitivity significantly up to 67% as compared to 41% for conventional staining. So here, how it is looked in the Robert Gomery stain, See, this is a cystic, uh, black color cystic uh, organism. So that's why it is called as pneumocystis. And this is the immunofluorescent uh, uh, staining pattern of the pneumocystis uh, organism. There are scope for special mycological investigation. New investigation are coming like PCR, beta d glucan and plasma cell free DNA. There are several issues with each of these uh, investigations, but uh, they are, uh, they are having very high sensitivity and negative predictive value. So if these tests are coming negative, we can think that patient is not having underlying PCP. But for PCR, there is an issue with the validation, whether you are taking samples from the upper respiratory tract or lower respiratory tract. So for upper respiratory tract, there can be colonization rather than infection. So for that, the results are not validated. So that is a problem with the uh, this new test. So bar sample is always recommended. On the other hand, beta glucan is non-specific. We know that candida infection are common in HIV. So uh, that is another reason that beta glucan can be increased. For that reason, the cutoff value, which is normally considered 80 picogram per ml, is considered 100 picogram per ml to increase the specificity in HIV cases. But this test is not recommended as a standalone test. Another thing is plasma cell free DNA. This is a new technique. Uh, this has also got the sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 93.4% .4 when compared to the uh, staining, normal staining. So the test can either be more sensitive or more specific. So there is a rationale of combining two tests. So it is recommended that you to combine two of these tests, one of the conventional tests and one of the advanced tests so that you can get a better result. So PCR is an important additional diagnostic method. And when it is combined with the staining, it increases the yield of the diagnosis by 7%. On the contrary, the BD, BDG combined with LDH level using threshold of more than 400 uh, uh, you have to understand that usually with PCP uh, cases, uh, the BDG level is uh, usually more than 500 to 1000 picogram per ml, though the cutoff has been set for 100. So if we combine these uh, LDH and BDG, uh, the specificity for PCP will, uh, will be as uh, high as 84%. But again, the clinical manifestation of several diseases are similar. It is important to seek definitive diagnosis. We can start treatment with, uh, without uh, confirming the diagnosis. But ultimate diagnosis should be established because we might be missing something underlying the uh, serious case of PCP. So this is a simplified version. If you have a clinical suspicion of PCP, uh, if patient is sick enough, you can directly go for the consider uh, empiric therapy for this patient. But after that, you should have to go for chest X-ray. So if chest X-ray is typical for PCP, then 
uh, you have to start the therapy if you have not already started. And the empiric therapy, uh, after starting the empiric therapy, we have to go for the uh, definitive test. And two tests we have to combine ideally, as I have already mentioned. Since 25% of the cases uh, will have normal X ray, we have to go for the uh, CT scan and diffusion uh, scan for the patient. If these tests are normal, then automatically we will consider that the patient is not having TCP and we can observe for the new symptoms to develop. If the test is abnormal and we are finding the classical findings or something like that, then again we have to uh, confirm the case at, at last. So, how to judge the severity of TCP pneumonia? So, as I told you, that ABG is the first thing we have to do. So, a partial pressure of oxygen in the ABG, if it is more than 70, the patient is considered to have mild TCP. On the contrary, if uh, it is uh, less than 70, we have to consider the patient to have severe disease. We can also classify according to the arterial, uh, alveolar arterial gradient, gradient. That is, if it is less than 35, it is mild. And if it is more than 45, it is severe. Another thing uh, which uh, uh, says that if the patient is having severe TCP is the more, LDH value of more than 500 milligram per deciliter. Poor prognostic, which was found by a meta-analysis are like higher the age, lack of knowledge of HIV zero status, multiple episodes, marked chest radiographic abnormalities, peripheral blood leukocytosis, low hemoglobin, low serum albumin, co-pathogen like CMV and pulmonary carcosis. So coming to the treatment. So while considering the treatment, you, we have to have some basic idea. First thing is treatment should not be delayed if the PCP is clinically suspected. As I have already told that it is a serious infection, you are not supposed to delay the treatment. Empiric therapy should be started right away uh, while the diagnostic workup are going on. So steroids are indicated in severe disease and should be started within 72 hours. Risk of virus is low in PCP, so that is a very good part. Since uh, uh, there are studies uh, which I will be telling later that early initiation of ART is uh, helpful. So since I uh, only problem with early initiation of ART is the risk of iris. So uh, since it is low with the uh, PCP, we can start uh, ART as early as possible. Treatment duration is usually indicated for 21 days, but can be increased on the basis of clinical features for the patient. And for pregnancy, we have to consider high dose folic acid, that is 4 milligram per day, only in the first trimester because uh, uh, there are several studies which say that if we give the high dose folic acid, the treatment response is not good. But to prevent the teratogenicity of the fetus, we are supposed to uh, give the uh, folic acid in early trimester. So here is a study. Uh, Early antiretroviral anti th therapy is associated with the better outcome. So here, uh, other than TB, if we start uh, early ART, the mortality is low among the participants. So that is a very good thing. So the one thing we have to do when a patient present with the suspected PCP is to rule out that uh, TB. We have advanced technologies now, CT scan, CBNAT, with which we can uh, we can be sure that patient is not having TB. If TB is ruled out, we should start ART within the two weeks as, or as early as possible because TB is the thing which has uh, 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 given us the disadvantage that it can cause the iris in the patient. So with this study, we can ascertain that if uh, TB is not there, we should start ART as early as possible. Uh, it has a uh, beneficial outcome. And uh, another important thing regarding the treatment is there is a huge lacuna. There are no new studies. All the treatment of the new cystis uh, is dependent on the outdated uh, old evidence. So uh, this uh, meta-analysis uh, considered the 469 studies and out of that only 14 were the RCTs and all the studies were based on the high dose of uh, time oxazone. Uh, so uh, even uh, there are new studies which say, says that uh, low dose are having better outcome and low side effect profile still we are giving the uh, high dose uh, uh, time uh, with open sulfur with oxazone treatment for the patients. So that part is not clear. Another thing is uh, the studies were majorly conducted on white male with HIV in the era before modern critical care and endometrial therapy. So there is a need of new studies and new RCTs for uh, the diagnosis and management and treatment of the PCP cases. Every aspect of the therapy like dose, duration of fail, uh, failure, side effects, recovery, and adjunctive corticosteroid, corticosteroids were based on limited number of studies. So here is a lacuna. So whatever we are having, they are just the guidelines. We have to decide we have to act promptly according to the clinical condition of the cases. So this was the forest plot for the success of treatment in uh, uh, the, say, the past study which I was mentioning. So most of the studies, uh, though they are few, they favor for the uh, uh, time oxazole treatment. And other therapies are not that much favored. Uh, so uh, this is clear from this uh, 
meta analysis another thing is side effect profile so all the if we are talking about side effect uh, side effect profile uh, other therapies other than cotrimoxazole are favored so that simply means that though it is a first line therapy cotrimoxazole it is not the best therapy when it comes to the side effect for the patient and uh, believe me the side effects are very high for uh, the patient who are taking high dose of uh, cotrimoxazole so first we will come for the profile axis so when we are uh, after that we will cover the treatment part so when we are supposed to start the profile axis when the cd4 counts are less than 200 or cd4 percentage are less than 14 percent we should also consider starting uh, primary profile axis when the cells are less than 250 but we are not able to start art for example in a cases with tb so if even if in those cases uh, the uh, count uh, cd4 count is less than 250 still we are supposed to start the uh, profile axis primary profile axis and secondary profile axis we have to start right away after the uh, uh, treatment of the pcp uh, cases so these are the preferred regimen uh, tmp uh, smx is only the preferred regimen and uh, uh, there are different uh, schedules for that uh, double strain single strain tablet po per day or it can be thrice weekly both are recommended uh, there is again a lack of clinical trial uh, atovaquin is quite expensive dapsone and look, uh, pyrimethamine is uh, also a good option, but, but uh, we have to look for the G6PD deficiency for the uh, chances of hemolysis. Pentamidine is uh, advised in aerosolized form. The good part of this is that uh, it is a monthly uh, regimen. All of these four drugs are recommended. So when to terminate? When the cells have become more than 200 for more than three months after the ART started uh, starting. So uh, that is uh, when we are supposed to terminate the profile axis. And uh, we can consider uh, uh, when CD4 count is 100 to 200, but viral counts are suppressed uh, to undetected level. At that time also, we can consider uh, stopping the uh, profile axis if it is this state per persists for more, about more than, uh, more than three to six months. But for secondary profile axis, CD4 count more than 200. Uh, if the uh, disease by diagnosed, even after CD4 counts were more than 200, by not on ART, we have to terminate profile axis if HIV RNA levels are suppressed. That is the only way uh, we can decide in these patients whether to continue or not to continue uh, profile axis. And when to restart? If the cells are less than 300, uh, 100, sorry, and CD4 counts are uh, 100 to 200, but HIV is more than uh, the detection uh, limit of the ACE used. So there are various treatment regimens. Uh, there are no new studies. I have already told you this are again based on very uh, age old studies. The first line again is uh, cotrimoxazole. It can be given PO or IV. PO for mild and moderate disease, IV for uh, severe diseases. So, uh, availability of IV uh, cotrimoxazole is an issue in every hospital uh, all across the country. So, uh, dose is recommended for 21 days. And here we have to consider several things. As I have already told that uh, there are several studies which say that uh, low dose cotrimoxazole can be effective. So we are supposed to consider low doses for elderly CKD patient, hyperkalemic patient, uh, other nephrotoxic drugs like uh, other antibiotics and uh, AC inhibitors uh, which can cause hyperkalemia, pregnancy and we should also observe for side effects. Uh, as I have already told that side effects are quite common. Another alternative therapies are Dapson and uh, trimethoprim. Uh, at our account, these are only recommended for mild to moderate disease. While clindamycin and primaquine combination is recommended for uh, treatment of severe disease. So combination is used when uh, the patient is deemed to have severe disease. Well, simply clindamycin can be effective for mild to moderate disease. So most of, many uh, clinicians now recommend that uh, since these drugs are easily available and easy to administer with uh, good side effect profile. So we should consider uh, clindamycin as a first line therapy, but again, the data is lacking for this uh, thing. Another is, uh, thing is pentamidine. Uh, the high dose 4 mg per kg is used, but if patient is having side effects, even 3 mg per kilogram dose can be considered. Uh, this is again an option for severe disease, when nothing else we can use this. But for this, only IV is uh, for treatment of uh, PCP disease. Aerosolized is, uh, form is not recommended. It is recommended for the treatment of, uh, like for the profile axis, but not for the Treatment. Salvage therapy now coming is casfofungin with or without uh, cotrimoxazole. This is uh, this should be used when nothing is available since the drug is expensive. And we all know when to start the steroids. Prednisone, we have to start when uh, 
our patient is having severe disease the treatment regimen is for 21 days from 40 bd to tapering dose up to 20 mg to daily but here is a catch which nobody um, like most of us might miss that the dose which is recommended is for prednisone it is not recommended for methylprednisolone or prednisolone which are more commonly available or more easily available so when we are giving the injectable drugs we should uh, correct the dose if we are using the methylprednisolone it has to be used for about 75% of the prednisone do dose and it is recommended for only severe diseases uh, and uh, should be started within 72 hours so how to monitor the treatment so no yes, i have already told pcp cases may deteriorate initially for 3 to 5 days and this do not represent the failure or iris this is simply because of the cell lysis and uh, causing the inflammatory reaction so that doesn't mean that patient is having iris or patient is having uh, treatment failure so a uh, thorough evaluation for icu admission is warranted in these cases as i have already told that patient can get sick any time even after treatment they usually uh, go deterioration so patient uh, better to have a icu bed for these patients it is uh, it would be wise for from our part to do so after adverse reaction are quite common with the uh, co trimoxazole therapy that is up to 85% can be there so rash is the most common thing which can uh, exacerbate up to, uh, to the steven johnson syndrome but if only rash is the problem the therapy has to be continued and the rash is to be managed with the simple antihistaminics and all another common thing is fever and uh, uh, other things which are not that common but still happens are bone marrow suppression azotemia hepatitis and hyperkalemia adr with the alter th alternative therapy it is not like that uh, they are so pure even uh, dapsone is associated with the meth hemoglobinemia hemolysis is common with primaquin so g6pd deficiency uh, ruling out that uh, deficiency has uh, it is warranted we do so uh, another thing is pancreatitis this uh, glycemia and cardiac dysarrhythmia with pentamin so how to go for the management of the treatment failure so defined as a lack of improvement or worsening of the respiratory function documented by the rtr that gets after more than 4 days as i have already told if it is more than 3 to 5 days it is it can happen even with the right treatment in the right patient but if it is more than 4 days uh, even after 4 days or 5 days the patient is getting deteriorated so that means that we are having a treatment failure so clinical uh, clinician should wait for more than 4 days and uh, to manage first we have to review the compliance proper dose and proper formulation whether we are giving it or not we have to consider other co infection that is very important therapeutic drug monitoring is a option if it is possible we should always do it uh, especially in the elderly ckd patients treatment failure is attributed to the treatment uh, uh, limiting toxicities um, and that can occur in up to in one third of the patients so in that case and uh, if we suspect there is a resistance against the first line therapy we should think of the alternative therapy and start treatment right away so here i have simplified uh, if uh, severity of pcp we have to judge the severity of uh, the pcp if pao2 is more than 70 it is a mild and moderate disease options are oral coprimoxazole etovaquone tindamycin dapsone uh, then we have to uh, if the patient is having pao2 of uh, less than 70 it is a severe disease options are iv coprimoxazole tindamycin plus primaquin or iv pentamidin but uh, better to avoid that drug and steroids we have to give if this is so we have to look for the clinical response if more than 21 days therapy uh, is recommended uh, 21 days therapy is recommended if patient is improving uh, we have to stop after 21 days but even if that uh, after that patient is prog progressing after 4 to 8 days we have to exclude the improper dose non compliance co infection and change the treatment uh, regimen so with that i finish my talk uh, thank you we are happy to take queries if we are able to solve this thank you so much dr yash and we sincerely thank all the participants for the patient listening and we are highly indebted to them we will especially thank arvind mathur sir uh, for his guidance uh, we will also thank dr rajiv parthik sir for giving a talk and guiding us if there are any queries they can be taken on the uh, chat box if there are no queries we will be like we will like to thank all the participants and uh, we will close this meeting we will try to have such meetings every month on a particular topic and uh, thank you all thank you arvin